Ian Cheney and Kurt Ellis are the main characters of this film. They are two friends fresh out of college who decided to travel to Iowa to discover the role that corn plays in the food industry. They play an acre of corn and decide to follow its journey through the industry and meet many experts along the way that inform them about the consequences of corn being configured in almost everything we eat. Filmmakers and background. The filmmakers of this documentary are Ian Cheney, Kurt Ellis, and Aaron Wolf. Ian Cheney. Ian Cheney is an Emmy-nominated and Peabody Award-winning documentary filmmaker. Ian graduated from Milton Academy in 1998 and then got his bachelor's and master's degree from Yale University. Kurt Ellis. Kurt Ellis is an American filmmaker, social entrepreneur, and advocate for sustainable agriculture and healthy food. Kurt also attended Milton Academy and later earned his BA from Yale University in 2002. Aaron Wolf. Aaron Wolf is a film producer and has directed several documentaries, including King Corn. Prior to his film career, Wolf worked as a commercial fisherman. Wolf graduated from Middlebury College and then proceeded to earn his master's in film at the University of Iowa. Who funded the film? The company that helped fund the f project was ITVS. This is an organization that partners with filmmakers and funds films that they believe need to be heard by the people and help them reach public television. The project participants. Steve Macko. Steve Macro is the research faculty director at the University of Virginia. He showed Ian and Kurt that the food we eat will eventually show up in our hair. Steve explained to them that the carbon in their bodies originates from corn. Charles Pyatt. Charles Pyatt is the farmer that allowed the boys to grow an acre of corn on his land. Pyatt also taught Ian and Kurt the basis of how to grow corn and explained the farming business to them. He told them about the farm program and how they would get money from the government for growing corn. Al Marth. Al Marth is a certified crop advisor and he helped Kurt and Ian grow their corn by selling and explaining to them the proper tools and substances they need. He showed them what to buy and explained why it would produce corn. All right, so the learning outcome and the summary. Um, in the film King Corn, the filmmaker's main purpose is to show some of the main products and the byproducts of corn and how detrimental it is to our everyday lives. Uh, when Kurt and Ian set out to Iowa, they had a goal to plant one acre of corn, um, and that is to plant, fertilize, harvest, and then see where that product goes to. Uh, overall, they realized that corn is in almost everything that we consume, uh, whether that be from a product with the corn ingredients itself or byproduct. Uh, more along with that, um, this film is really eye-opening uh, to those that may not be involved in agriculture um, or that know very little about where our food comes from. Uh, King Corn breaks down all the end uses and products that corn is in. Um, that alone brings awareness regarding as to, you know, how, how much of an impact that has on our lives and, and you know, what really what corn is all in. Uh, so that, that chart there kind of shows, you know, really how much of sport we, we have in the U.S. To understand the social and historical context around the documentary King Corn, you'll first need to understand some history about the American corn industry since the Great Depression, which saw family farms bankrupted and left many families hungry. In the early 20th century, corn was grown almost exclusively by family farms. As part of the New Deal following the aftermath of the Great Depression, the government began to limit the amount of corn that could reach the market each year in an effort to keep corn prices high so as to remain profitable for family farms. In 1971, Earl Butts was appointed the Secretary of Agriculture, and he began a major policy shift for the farming industry. In an effort to combat food insecurity, he implemented a system designed around maximizing production. Maintaining profitability for farmers would now be made possible with subsidies rather than limiting supply. And with no limits on supply, the more a farmer can produce, the more they will profit. This led to the consolidation of smaller farms into more efficient larger farms and to exploration into more uses for corn, such as livestock feed, biofuels, plastics, and the common sweetener, high fructose corn syrup. This is the context surrounding the King Corn documentary from 2007. Corn products have become so prevalent in our food industry that nearly everything we eat is dependent on corn in some form or another. And the rise in Americans' use of corn-related food products, specifically high fructose corn syrup, 
coincides with our crisis of diabetes and obesity. This is the lens that the film wants you to see the industry through. Now, since this film was made, little has changed in the American corn industry. Farms continue to grow larger while favoring productivity over nutrition. The family farm is all but non-existence in regards to corn production. Corn products, including high fructose corn syrup, are still prevalent in our food industry, and the subsidies that the industry depends on are still in place. We believe the film missed an opportunity to explore the pros and cons of other solutions to the 20th century health crisis, besides changes in corn production, such as alternative subsidies of fruits and vegetables or the effect of tax disincentives. Factor fiction. As soon as the film game began, the first major message was, we are the first generation living shorter lifespans than our parents because of what we are eating. Wow, this is very specific and terrifying claim. It certainly sparked my interest in the, although the film brings attention to an underappreciated field, it's important to address whether audiences are being misled or manipulated. In this section, we will cover two fallacies and one half truth that may even be completely false. Let's start with our first fallacy. From the Philosophy Lander Education website, for a correlation to be considered a causation, there should be strong statistical association in a variety of circumstances and conditions. It must be consistent with current scientific information, and the cause must always precede its effect. In our situation, we have two distinct events on which a false cause that we found is based. The increased production of corn after the Farm Bill of 1973 and the correlated increase in obesity and type 2 diabetes. For each kernel of our corn turned into high fructose corn syrup, there's a nearly 70% chance it will end up sweetening a beverage, likely headed for a big city far from the Corn Belt. In Brooklyn, New York, about 139 million gallons of soda are consumed each year, sweetened by 20,000 acres of corn. Okay, implied claim. Though it wasn't explicitly stated, the use of video clip editing suggests this causation implicitly to susceptible viewers. The video plays a daunting tune in a low octave while showing corn kernels traveling across the country, implying that they're not spreading anything good. In this way, the film establishes a narrative and leads the viewer to the assumption that corn sweetener production and distribution directly result in diabetes and obesity. Is this true, though? It seems relatively clear enough from the video, but let's continue by asking ourselves the questions of what makes a true causation to see if this is a false cause fallacy. Is there a relationship between the two variables that's consistent with current scientific information? We did find a study that concluded that countries with more high fructose corn syrup have a 20% higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes, but it only took into consideration country level estimates of a few variables, including total sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and total calories available. From the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, eating more refined carbs, mainly corn syrup, combined with less intake of fiber paralleled with the upper trend, trend in type 2 diabetes. And a 2007 study on the causes of diabetes and obesity suggested that the variables listed on this slide contribute more to the complex phenomenon of population health than diet and exercise alone. We can now see some reasons for it not to be concluded that eliminating or reducing corn or high fructose corn syrup production will, with certainty, reduce the prevalence of diabetes and obesity. Without A, B does not absolutely follow. The oversimplification fallacy takes multiple causes and reduces them to just one or a few. This is important to call out because viewers like simple answers to complex problems. It's easy to digest, but we think this film may be taking advantage and capitalizing on the oversimplification of their implied solutions to 21st century, the 21st century health crisis. So at this point in the film, they've established that corn has no nutritional value and only causes adverse metabolic syndromes, at least according to Walter Wallet from the universe, Harvard University. Now, Michael Pollan, a frequent commentator in the film, says, everything on your plate is corn with the context being fast food. This is all not true and exaggerates the composition of corn in fast food. We think that the intent here is to make an entertaining fast fact, but it guilts viewers into not establishing products that contain corn, consuming products that contain corn instead of helping them make informed decisions, resulting in unneeded stress on people who rely on this food in part or in whole to get by and survive. In this direct quote by Dr. Lauren Cordian, 
Um, it is claimed that grass-fed T-bone steaks have up to 9 grams of saturated fat, but grass-fed have 1.3 grams. When we look at a T-bone steak, it's characterized by a large band of fat. We can't know exactly what Dr. Cordian means, since butchers trim uh, T-bone steaks in a variety of ways, and some breeds of cow are bred to be leaner or fatter than others, and we don't know the size of steak he's referring to. We look, when we looked at organic grass-fed beef from trueorganicbeef.com, we saw that their nutritional facts for a four-ounce steak contained seven grams of saturated fat, which would make Dr. Gordian's claim inaccurate. From a 2014 article in the journal International Journal of Meat Science that compared U.S. studies, it was found that the most significant difference in fat content was in the monounsaturated fatty acids, with grass-fed beef having 1.8 grams per 100 grams less than grain-fed. It also suggested that beef from both kinds of feeding styles contribute to a wide variety of important nutrients in the U.S. diet, and either can be compatible with efforts to improve the cardiovascular health of Americans. Research is still ongoing and is considered limited, so although Dr. Cordian uh, might not be completely false, it's certainly not completely true. Following the narrative constructed in the film, we are concerned with the public's influence on policy. What we don't want is for drastic measures to be adopted and conformed to by politicians and policymakers because of popular demand. We think this film may serve to fearmonger society with false ideas about how production of corn is contributing to societal health problems while ignoring other major variables. This may cause unneeded stress on poor populations who feel guilty about their need to incorporate grass, grain-fed beef, and high fructose corn syrup in their diet and may cause the voices of our most food insecure to be diminished while the voices of the more privileged cause drastic change around them. After some debate, our group has come to a collective conclusion about King Corn documentary. The film had a good intention to educate the non-agricultural audience, but did so with some inaccuracies and logical fallacies. The director allowed some misinformation to be illustrated, such as including the scene where a fast food customer speaks about the dire health effects of a corn-fed diet for cows. His statement was not factual and the director did, made no attempt to refute the assertion. Overall, the group gives King Corn a 4 out of 10 on a scale of very biased to very fair. The film was well-intentioned but leaned too far, far into the unverified scare tactics.